Welcome to the Libre Quest podcast. My name is Matt. This is episode 54. Today I'm being joined by the maintainer of AV Linux, Glenn MacArthur. How's it going, Glenn? It's going well. How are you? Good. And I just want to state that w this is actually in addition to the recording that we did previously because the audio was uh, kind of messed up. So we're actually re-recording the uh, just the first portion of the interview. So it's actually good to talk to you again, Glenn. Yeah, thank you. I, I get to bore people twice. So, you know, <laughs> lucky me. <laughs> um, so I think uh, in the first section, really what we covered is uh, what is AV Linux? And uh, can you talk about your uh, history with uh, how you got started using Linux? Okay, yeah, sure. So, um, well, AV Linux is a, uh, it's basically an installable uh, ready to use uh, Linux distribution uh, for content creation. So uh, multi-track audio recording, mini composing, uh, audio, I'm sorry, uh, video editing, audio editing as well, of course, uh, a little bit of graphics stuff. Uh, basically, it's a ready to use system so you can get right to work, have all the tweaks and all the kind of secret little uh, magic done. Uh, and just get right to work doing uh, audio recording or, or whatever kind of multimedia content uh, you want to create. Uh, and it originally kind of started out as a, um, uh, it kind of started out as a, like an install and use kind of thing, kind of everything, but the kitchen sink all included. It's been scaled back a little bit uh, in recent years from that, but I think you could, ins you could, you know, boot it off the USB key and pretty much do anything you would want to do. Uh, and pretty much do everything that Linux is now capable of as far as doing that kind of work. And how how did you, because you'd covered this yesterday, how you kind of got started uh, or how you were introduced to Linux and why you kind of began to develop AV Linux. Okay, well, it's uh, as as yesterday, it was. it's a bit of a long story getting to Linux in the first place, but I'll start at the beginning. Uh, so I'm not really a computer. I was never a computer person. I didn't take any schooling for computers. Uh, so back in the mid nineties, uh, I had a bandmate uh, and he was into computers and he was kind of selling me on, uh, I was at the time using tape machines uh, to do recording. And he was kind of trying to sell me on, you know, computers are the way to do this. So he kind of convinced me uh, so I think it was 95, I got my first uh, PC, and it had Windows 95 on it. And because I knew going in that I, this is a, something I wanted to use primarily for audio recording, I mean, of course, I could use it for business purposes and all that. Uh, I kind of did a, quite a bit of research before I bought, and I bought myself a dedicated sound card uh, which at its time was actually ahead of its time. It was a Turtle Beach Pinnacle was the sound card, and it cost almost as much as the rest of the PC. Uh, and it was really cool. It did 24-bit audio way back then. Uh, it did wavetable uh, wave sampling. In fact, you could, you could put memory uh, sims on the card itself and store your samples right on the card. And the other cool thing it had was it had a Kurzweil synthesizer chip. Uh, I think it was... The chip that was used in the Kurzweil K2000 hardware sense was also built right into this card. So at the time, I thought this was cutting edge stuff. I thought I was, you know, I was going to be set for life. And it was an ISA card. So we get to the late 90s. Uh, in the meantime, uh, I've got the pinnacle working. I've kind of discovered all the things you can do with it. I was using uh, a Cubase VST, I think the first version of Cubase that uh, hosted uh, virtual studio technology plugins or VST plugins. So I had the world by the tail. Uh, I was just loving it. I had great MIDI stuff happening. I could load my own samples into things. Uh, and then in a matter of about four years, it all came grinding to a halt because number one, ISA slots disappeared on computers and were replaced by PCI slots. So right away, my Pinnacle card was a boat anchor. Uh, I was pretty much either had to use ancient PCs that didn't have very much processing power to run very many tracks, or I had to move ahead and, and let the Pinnacle go. So in about, and then uh, Windows XP came out shortly after that. And uh, 
the version of Cubase I was using was only for Windows 95 and 98. And if I wanted to move to the next version of Cubase uh, for Windows XP, uh, I was basically had to buy a whole new version. And if you bought Cubase, it's not a cheap program. I think it was in the neighborhood of $279. And that was back in the mid 90s or late 90s. So uh, I, in, in about four years, I had kind of had the Dream Studio and lost it only because uh, the hardware technology had evolved. We'd lost ISA slots and the software uh, technology had evolved to newer and newer operating systems. And Windows wasn't always, when they made the leap to from 98 to XP, uh, kind of going from into the NT-based Windows, a lot of the older programs didn't work anymore. So, so I was kind of bummed out and disillusioned by doing music on computers after I'd kind of been sold on the idea. So I just kind of went away mad and I started doing video editing instead. So how does that tie into getting involved with Linux? Well, we, we're, we're going to get there. Don't worry. Uh, so I got involved with vid doing video editing and like video restoration work. And I joined uh, the videohelp.com forum, which uh, is still existing and still a very busy, probably the number one resource for like uh, doing video editing and video work. Uh, and there was a thread on there uh, in about 2006 about uh, trying Linux for the first time. And the guy who kind of started the thread and was kind of doing the rah-rah job for Linux was using a distribution called Mepis. So after reading several debates, arguments back and forth, I'm, I'm sure like this guy was totally getting flamed for how useless Linux was, especially for video work, because at that time there were hardly any video editors for Linux. I decided to give Mepis a try. And I had a laptop that was a few years old, and I installed Mepis, and I think it was KDE 3.5, and the little cursor would bounce up and down. And I was blown away that everything on my computer was working perfectly. The, the Wi-Fi worked. I didn't have to go find any drivers. I didn't have to go find any third-party anything. I just got the ISO image of Mepis, installed it on this laptop, and everything worked. And I was kind of blown away by that. But once I got using it for a while, I kind of got hungry to start doing multimedia stuff again. And for all its you know, great attributes, Mepis was not a great distribution at that point in time for doing multimedia work. So um, that's uh, when I tried uh, Ubuntu Studio. And that was the first release of Ubuntu Studio, which I believe was on uh, Ubuntu 7.10. Uh, which was called Gutsy Gibbon in their clever naming schemes. Um, so I, I uh, got a proper introduction uh, to what multimedia applications were available on Linux. Uh, so I used Gutsy Gibbon and Ubuntu Studio for a, a little while, but when I, uh, I, I didn't really realize how Ubuntu worked and I didn't realize that they kind of had long, long-term releases and they sort of had these in-between short-term releases. And I had unwittingly started with 7.10, which the point 10 is usually their kind of interim uh, try out new stuff releases. And uh, I kind of noticed that after about six months or so, the updates for things really dried up. And there was, uh, I was kind of hitting a wall, but I really liked the operating system and the stuff, the real, I think I had a real time kernel in it. Uh, and stuff was really working great. So I kind of started figuring out and learning very slowly and very awkwardly uh, how to do compile stuff. So and then I kind of realized that, hey, there's a new version of so and so out. I don't have to really worry about whether it appears in the repository or not. I can just kind of get the source code and build it for myself. So coming from a closed shop like Windows, where you kind of had no control over these kinds of things and could never speak to a developer, uh, that just blew my mind uh, that that I could actually uh, build the software update for myself. So after uh, a while of doing that, I kind of had a really heavily customized uh, Ubuntu Studio that was kind of much more up to date and kind of had gained some pretty valuable updates um, 
So I kind of really thought, this is kind of cool. Like, why don't more people do this? And I think I mentioned the, uh, the first time, uh, in between there, when, when I got let down by uh, Cubase and having to upgrade so quickly, uh, I had tried some of the other uh, programs, like N-Track Studio was one of them. I, I tried yeah. quite a bit. And some of the other kind of lesser known, uh, but still, you know, pretty powerful software programs. And uh, uh, I kind of noticed uh, Ardor 2 had just come out when I started messing around with Ubuntu Studio. And Ardor 2 was every bit as capable for the most part. There was probably a little less plugins to choose from. But as far as being stable and being able to do audio recording, which at that time, that's mostly what I was doing, I found Ardor was, you know, really a great program to use. And as I got more interested in using Ardor, I joined the Ardor forum. And of course, I, I also uh, realized they had an IRC chat channel. And this is what really blew my mind is after having some problems and going on the IRC chat and realizing number one, I was talking to the actual developers of Ardor. Like if I didn't get Paul Davis himself, the primary developer, I would get Robin Garius. And they would hands on, if it was something that wasn't my fault and something that was actually a bug in the software, they would fix it and I could just grab the source code and build my own update and fix my own problem. So having that kind of access, first of all, to talk to the developers, to have input with the developers and get things changed almost instantly, and then to be able to just grab uh, the updated software and build it for myself, I mean, that sold me on on the on the whole you know sort of community structure and the interactive uh, nature of, of, of Linux. And that's kind of where AB Linux sort of began so after a while, when I had this uh, pretty functional, tweaked, updated, fixed uh, system uh, of, of Ubuntu Studio, I got looking around and I found a program uh, called RemasterSys. And RemasterSys was developed by a, a fellow Canadian. Uh, I guess we missed that at the beginning. I'm, I'm Canadian. so um, And uh, <laughs> I, I kind of got to know him online a little bit. And uh, I started using RemasterSys to make my own custom uh, version of, uh, of Ubuntu Studio. And I kind of posted it uh, on the Ardor forum. And just kind of as a tongue-in-cheek sort of joke, I called it uh, AV Linux, you know, like the AV, uh, you know, the AV department at, at high school or whatever, you know, the geeky kids that do the audio video stuff. I just kind of like, I was obviously turning into quite a geek myself. So I called it AV Linux as kind of a half joke and it actually started to kind of generate some interest and people who were interested in trying Linux for the first time or people that wanted something a little more updated than what was the current version of Ubuntu Studio uh, would download it and try it and that's kind of where the whole thing started and how I kind of got switched from Windows to Linux. Yeah, that is awesome. Such a, such a really cool story and I think you you'd covered uh, yesterday how uh, support had ended for uh, the uh, remaster sys and how you found another uh, avenue to go but either way you you kept going with the project and you know uh, uh, no matter what obstacles you came into and yeah i, I forgot to mention you're in uh, ontario as well yes that's that's yeah. fine that's, that's fine <laughs> worth mentioning because the remaster sys guy was you know lives about 45 minutes we haven't we've, we've talked online a lot we haven't met in person but he, he lives about 45 minutes from me which was just also that's, blew my mind that's so cool you know the one of the programs i was using was by some somebody so close to me so yeah that is awesome all right i guess uh that's it for our dub over and the remainder of the podcast is going to be the recording we did from yesterday yeah that sounds cool thanks uh, very much for uh, the do-over i really appreciate it But I wanted to ask you also, because I know you'd mentioned that you're currently using, uh, or you currently have like a production studio. And I'm wondering, uh, like, what kind of tools are you using in AV Linux to, you know, for your production in your studio? Um, well, I think uh, the first one is kind of debatable, but uh, um, I've tried to, as much as possible, provide a kernel with full real-time preemption. Uh, and I think uh, a lot of people will say that's not needed anymore. And I think 
that that's probably becoming more and more true. But uh, it seems to give the best potential for getting latency down. Uh, and as you know, for audio recording, um, especially if you're kind of recording uh, directly, uh, like if you're like running your guitar through a plug-in rather than micing mm -hmm. your amp, yeah. or if you're you know working with MIDI and synthesizers, the, the lower we can get the system latency, the better. So I guess the first thing that uh, I try and do with in with my studio in mind, and uh, for other people, is to start with the uh, real-time kernel. Now I should mention. Uh, AV Linux is kind of a one-man show except for the kernel. So a few years ago, um, there was a, a guy, I had a forum for a few years, but the, unfortunately, the nature of my work, uh, I can like I can be full on task with AV Linux for two or three weeks at a time, and then I'll be busy and I'll be offline for a month. And that's not very good for a forum or even a repository or any of those sorts of things. So, uh, so I had a guy who said, you know, um, I was I was doing the kernels, making my own kernels. And he said, you know, uh, I'm kind of interested in doing this and I'm on the kernel mailing list and I'd be happy to uh, start doing the kernels if you want. So, and that's a, he was a fellow from Pennsylvania. His name was, uh, name's Trulin Martin. Uh, and he's, uh, he's got a young guy with a young family. So he's a very busy, busy man. Um, so we don't, uh, we haven't really been in contact all that much recently, but so it was a big help for him to do the kernels because number one, I didn't have to do it. And number two, you know, he would really read up and study up on what the latest patches were for the kernel and kind of when's the best time for us to move to a newer kernel or should we stay, stay, uh, stay with what we're, we're using, uh, you know, that sort of thing. So that, that I got him, you know, give him his props for that. Uh, so uh, I, our studio basically is using Ardor most of the time. Uh, I also use Harrison Mixbus. Nice. Um, yeah. And I've got to say, uh, which Harrison Mixbus, of course, is a uh, commercial software based on Ardor, and it's a very uh, they have a great reciprocal relationship. Um, you know, Ardor provides the base for Mixbus, but uh, upstream development that improves Mixbus also gets put into Ardor. So I think it's been a really interesting success story between, you know, a, a fully open source floss program, uh, you know, kind of becoming into a symbiotic relationship with a commercial entity. So oh, I have a question. You know, I, think it I have a, I have a question sure. about uh, Harrison. Did they, ha did they, um, cause I haven't looked at all of their plugins, but do they still have some plugins that will only work on like a Mac system, but don't work on a Linux build? Um, no, it's not oh, to my knowledge. Good. I think okay. Harris, all of the products are fully cross-platform. So, okay. um, I think whatever works, uh, now I think with their latest, uh, they have a, a set of VST, uh, the AVA series of plugins and on Linux, they are a little particular about the OpenGL library version you have. Uh, uh, and so the age of your video hardware might have something to do with how well they work. I think for most people now with m newer systems and newer distributions and newer video cards, uh, it's not so much of a problem. But uh, other, th other than that was the only caveat I, I know of. Okay. Otherwise, I think everything, everything they do is for all three platforms. Uh, so, and basically uh, we have a, uh, basically running with Ardor, Mixbus. Uh, I have a 12 channel uh, mixer and uh, I have, I have 16 track capability in the studio. Um, and uh, yeah, it's been Linux only. Actually, I since I've started AV Linux, unfortunately, because my time uh, is very, varies quite a bit, I only use AV Linux. I don't really, you know, people go, Dude, have you tried this? Have you tried that? <laughs> yeah. Have you tried Ubuntu yeah. 32? And it's like, I don't have time to try anything. I, <laughs> I, it's all I can do to use AV Linux and keep up with the new developments and, 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 you know, integrate new things. And then, and then when I'm busy away from AV Linux, by the time I get back to it, I mean, there's usually weeks and weeks of work of just, you know, integrating new versions of things, updates of plugins, all that sort of stuff. So, uh, so I've been, we've been recording here with Linux from the get go. So what, uh, what sound card did you say you're, you're using in your studio? Uh, right now, actually, uh, uh, I've been through a few uh, uh, Presonus. Uh, so I had a uh, Presonus 1818 VSL at first, which was a eight-channel USB device. Uh, 
Uh, and now I'm using Presonus AR16, uh, which is, uh, it's a hardware mixer. So it's a full mixer, but it has uh, a multi-channel USB out. Very cool. So I can run, I can run. So it's actually, there's 12 faders, 12 channels, but the last four channels are stereo channels. Uh, I can, uh, I can, and it, it works like clockwork. You know, I can get 16 tracks of audio into Ardor without any difficulty at all. And so that, uh, so you're, so, and, yeah. Is your sound processing, is that handled on the mixer interface? Is that, is it basically like a one, a single unit? Uh, it's a single unit. Yeah. Oh, okay. So it's basically the, basically the, you know, the, the interface, of course, all the, you know, signal processing is done harder and that, yeah. but. Uh, so instead of just like a like a, a lot of people have, uh, oh, what is it, the Focusrite USB, uh, you know, interfaces where you plug your mic right into it. Yep. This is what I, well, the reason I have this is because since it's a full mixer, first of all, I can take it on the road when we play uh, out. And second of all, I can also do hardware uh, monitoring. So as you know, when you record audio, you always hear the 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 delayed sound of the audio going through the system, you get the latency and some sound cards or some interfaces, uh, you know, they kind of compensate for that. And there's like a direct dial where you don't ha hear the latency. But uh, for me, having the full mixer with, with, with the hardware faders and EQs and all that kind of stuff, basically I can use the faders and have zero hardware latency or zero monitoring latency, which for recording, you know, live is great because you're not, you know, you're not playing a note on your guitar and hearing it milliseconds later. <laughs> I can hear everything. Yeah. It's all coming in real time, right? So. So just out of curiosity, have you had anybody that you've spoken to or have you yourself tried any of the uh, old Delta series PCI cards on, with uh, AV Linux? Uh, yes. Um, I, now, uh, what were the... Well, like, my, I know the 1010 was memory. super popular. I had, yes. I actually had two 1010s uh, in a system. One of my early oh. systems had... Yeah. And you could... Uh, there was actually... I used to have a tutorial about it, but there was a way that you could uh, map them with Jack. You kind of had to run the uh, the SPDIF interface from one into the other. Otherwise, they would lose sync with each other. Oh, and yeah. then there was a way you could make a, a custom Jack layout uh, that saw them as a single audio device. Uh, so the 1010s were, were great cards. Yeah, no, I know they, they were huge They're for, oh gosh, it would have been, what, 14 or 15 years ago now. But yeah, they were huge, used yeah. everywhere. I mean, you know when your Linux distribution, when the Elsa Tools GUI package has an actual front end mixer for a, you know, for, to get any sort of a specialized mixer for any hardware on Linux, it must be pretty popular. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. What about, um, I, cause I, I've tried this before. I'm just curious if you've ac actually ever gotten one working, but a USB, I think they're 2.0, but a USB uh, Tascam external uh, sound card. Have you ever messed with those? Uh, actually, my first sound card I had was a US-122, uh, which was actually a USB-1 card. Okay. And they, they were very cagey on Linux because you had to have a special firmware that would load uh, at the time. So when you plug the card in, it would have to, instead of just having drivers in the kernel and just working, would have to have to load a custom firmware. And I just remember there was a big... You know, there's a big hack you had to do and files you had to tweak and twiddle with uh, to get it to work. But it did work fine, actually. It worked as well as it did wow. in Windows once you did all of that. See, I didn't, now, I, didn't know that. <laughs> I, I think some of the newer Tascam stuff, uh, I think they're starting to incorporate drivers for kernels. But I know the US-122 was always kind of a, if you didn't want to roll your sleeves up and figure out how to do it, you weren't going to get anywhere with it. And then they had a newer US-122 it also didn't work for some reason. Yeah, I think I, I think I, I think that was the one that I had. It was it was maybe either, it was either silver and blue or white and blue. It was kind of like a small light. Silver and blue. Silver and blue. Yeah, and I actually I got so frustrated with the thing not being able to to get it to work. I gave it to my brother. I was like, here, I can't get the thing to work on Linux. I don't know what to do. And now I now well, I learned I, there's a firmware I, thing. But. <laughs> yes, it was a firmware thing. And actually, I used to ship. I don't know if anyone else who used AV Linux had that sound card, but I always made sure to include that in AV Linux. So just for myself, when I upgraded and installed for testing purposes or whatever, I just knew that sound card would work. 
and maybe other people did too. Uh, but yeah, that was, uh, what was the other one? The M audio. I remember a, a oh, guy used to be on the art of the inbox. Uh, yes. The M box yeah. is another trick. I mean, there's been lots, I mean, a lot of this stuff comes out and it doesn't work. Right. And then you <laughs> either find somebody who rolls up their sleeves and gets it working, or you get someone that adds some USB tweaks to the kernel and sooner or later they get picked up and added to the mainstream kernel. Like, and now of course we can, as much as people may like or not like Apple, uh, the fact that iPads came out and would only work with class compli compliant USB devices on, in the Linux world, we have to be very grateful class compliant uh, USB devices because that's really why most of these devices now out of the box just work because they're class compliant, you know, largely. And that was, nobody was thinking about Linux when they did that. It was basically so they would work with iPads. Right. Yeah. That's true. Yeah, I, I always wanted. Uh, I never actually uh, purchased an inbox because um, I'd, I'd go for the cheaper options. But I always wanted to try one because I heard that you could maybe get them to work on Linux. But I never. Did, have, do you know anybody that actually used one with Linux? I I never had one myself, but I do recall like forum posts on Arter Forum of I think people try either trying to get it to work, and I think it wasn't until. It wasn't until years after that was a current piece of hardware that people actually did get it to work. I don't. Yeah. I, I think it was many years later, at the, to the point they were probably getting them secondhand, you know, on the used market. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. This some of those uh, big know, ones. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. That's a great way to get hardware if it still works. You know. Yeah. Yeah. No kidding. I mean, you still get the same. Like, there's been no like real progression from twenty four one ninety two or whatever, right? So, like, you can still get that quality on some of that old hardware. I mean, I would, yeah. you know. So, I don't know. I think it's still, this thing is still relevant. But. Yeah, no, no, for sure. I mean, yeah, if it does, if it does 24 bit, even if it does 24 bit 48, you're kind of, yeah, kind of, you're, you're, you're in the money. Yeah. I mean, it, exactly. it's all, I mean, it's all getting compressed to MP3 or MP4 at some point anyway, right? I mean, yeah, that's it's true. not I, when those devices came out and they had those hugely high sample rates. I mean, DVD audio was yeah, going to, I was, you know, yeah, that's it, about what I was about to say. Be the DVD successor audio. To, to CD audio, so of course we had to. I mean, I'm going to have, I'm going to be listening in 5.1 DVD audio. It's got to have 192, <laughs> you know, thousand kilobits. <laughs> right. It's got to have 20. Bit. And, and then, yeah. you know, at the same time, Napster and MP3s came out and, you know, the rest is, is yeah. history. Uh, DVD audio has never really happened. And yeah, I, I, everything we're doing now is, is getting made smaller and being exactly. compressed and yeah. taken away from them in some ways. Yeah, I remember when I bought um, I bought an Audigy 2 ZS uh, PCI card, and it had it came with a what did it come with? It was a, a Soldier of Fortune double helix and Hitman 2 uh, Silent Assassin, but it also came with a DVD audio sample, and like the the sound was amazing. I was like, man, this is this is amazing. You know, sound's gonna go 24 bit, all this stuff, and yeah, it just died. It's crazy, but yeah. it, it sounded yeah, good. It's, it's it sure <laughs> did. I I, yeah. I I have a friend who's a uh, He's got an older Acura car, and, and one of the uh, hallmarks of that car was they had a DVD audio stereo in it. And he wow. still has the, uh, the the sample disc that came with the car. So he'll pop it in. And, I mean, it does sound phenomenal. But, yeah, it's just crazy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah like, I mean, the, it's, the, it's the quality. Was, exhibit. Yeah, it was like you were in the room. It was amazing sounding. Like uh, I think the one that uh, – the the sample audio that w that came with that card was like an orchestra or something. And it just sounded like you were just sitting there next to him. The, the quality was so high. Yeah. Phenomenal for sure. for sure. But you know, we went, we went for, you know, we went for convenience over audio qualities. Yeah. That's how the world is. Well, it's been awesome talking to you. Thank you uh, so much for uh, coming on the podcast, accepting my invitation. Um, where can listeners find you online? I know Linux musicians, they, you're, there, you're there a lot, but where else can everybody find you uh, online? Um, well, actually, I, I'm not on social media anymore, so I'm not so easy to find with that. Uh, I do have uh, uh, Glenn MacArthur on, I do have a YouTube channel. Uh, so most of the uh, new release videos and that sort of stuff uh, is under my uh, my YouTube channel. So Glenn MacArthur, um, and actually uh, YouTube is not not something I've ever kind of pursued. But uh, I'm kind of alarmed at how many subscribers there are. And when I 
it's funny, I put music out and you get a hundred plays and I put out a tutorial about ABL drum kits and some of them are clocking up into like 15, 20,000 plays. Wow, that's so awesome. Go yeah. figure. So you can find me there. Uh, I'm on the Linux Musicians Forum, which you already mentioned, uh, as GMAC, uh, G-M-A-Q. Uh, and I am uh, on the uh, MEPIS, or sorry, the MX Linux Forum. Uh, I usually hang out in the respins section because AV Linux is essentially at this point in time a respin of MX Linux. So you can find me there as AV Linux. And uh, yeah, that's about, that's about where you can get me. Excellent. Well, thank you so much again for coming on. Well, I really appreciate it, Matt. Thanks for taking your time, not only to do uh, you know this with me, but all the other people that you take time to do it. It's it's just really great to have this stuff uh, get it, meet some of these people and get that stuff out there. And now, uh, you know, when I look at your avatar on the Linux Musicians Forum, I'll say, hey, I talked to that guy. <laughs> well, thank you. If you enjoyed this episode, you can join me on Locals at LibreQuest.Locals.com, where I'll be posting exclusive interviews, some of my music, and other things. And we can talk about whatever you want to talk about as well. For other ways to support me, you can visit LibreQuest.org. That's L-I-B-R-E-Q-U-E-S-T.org. And thank you for being a listener. Until next time, I'm Matt, and this is LibreQuest.